Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. We're going to get to our special guest in just a moment, but I wanted to take a quick second to say thank you. Thank you for listening and supporting this podcast. And thank you for your funny voicemails and lively comments on our website and the kind encouragement that you've given via emails. And if you're not familiar, the website is thethrillerzone.com and you can leave voicemails using the red button on the top right of the screen. Our email, thethrillerzone at gmail, or you can email me directly at davidtempleauthor at gmail. Okay, on today's show, I am pleased to welcome for a repeat performance, my two pals, Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson, otherwise known as Andrews Wilson. It's always a fun time with these guys, and I always walk away learning something. So let's get to it and jump into the Thriller Zone. Mr. Temple. Look how fancy we are, gentlemen. Right? <laughs> it's just uh, we can't help ourselves. Because we're players. <laughs> you be players. Everything's good in your world, Dave? Right? Yeah, Writing is good. Uh, this this podcast is uh, growing exponentially. I'm very Fantastic. thankful for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is. It has actually at the end of the year, I was double booking November, December, and January, and I said, if I don't uh, tap the brakes just a little bit, Daddy's not going to be able to do his own writing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. They, it can consume you. That's what Jason says too. He's like. You know, you say yes to like three things and all of a sudden, like you haven't had a day off. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sure. Well, it's and as a testament to that, you know, all that, right? Yeah, it was it was the the Putnam publicists already knew about you. You know, they, they reached out to you, I believe. Right. They did. Yes. Yeah. So that's a huge thing because we had nothing to do with that. They yeah. said, hey, there's this guy, Dave. Yeah. Temple. Would you like to do there? We're like. That's a buddy of ours. Yeah, we'll tell, of course we'll do it. Of course wow. we'll do it. Yeah, yeah we, was- we were planning to reach out for Sons of Valor because it we'd been on in the fall and uh, we figured we'd give it some time. But they knew about you and they wanted to connect. So that's wow. a good sign. That's a real good sign. That is a good sign. I'm very humbled by that. Thank you very much. And yes, they have, they've reached out uh, time and again. Matter of fact, I must be on some rap- rapid fire uh, inquiry now because uh, anything that's coming out. So I'm excited. And back to that previous uh, note is that when you're, you do, you get caught up. You're like, oh, wait a minute, Mark Graney. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ace Atkins. Yeah, sure. Bring them all. And then all of a sudden they, well, they're only available this day and you're stacking them up and you're like, well, I, I can only read so fast. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. During the holiday, uh, the wife would find me disappear and I'd come back uh, an hour and a half later. She goes, uh, reading, right? I'm like, yeah, homework, homework. Yeah, it's work. It's yeah. Work, man. Someone's got to do it. Exactly. No, but it's been fun. And uh, I am working on number 10. And it's funny, I went back and watched our show, uh, you know, which I tend to do with you guys, I like to go back and refer to what we've been talking about. And I think I make a comment that was September the 3rd, I believe it was. And I was making a comment. Yeah, I just started number 10, dude. I'm really excited. And you guys like, yeah. And I'm like, and as I was looking at it this morning, I'm like, uh, I haven't picked it up since then so. <laughs> yeah that's a problem <laughs> <laughs> all right so let's step from the uh, green room into the real room and as you sure can not. tell by now uh we're with good friends uh brian andrews and uh, jeffrey wilson uh the writing duo of andrews wilson in case anyone has been asleep at the wheel for the last i don't know how many years welcome <laughs> thanks good to be here we love the show well and it loves you <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is on our uh, our list of topics today to talk about, Rogue Asset. And uh, I think, I tend to say this a lot, but it's because it's reality. I was, I was jamming on this uh, late into the evening because I really wanted to finish it before we got started. And, um, and I hope this is a, it, it's a good thing. It's a compliment. Um, you know, it's, it's not saying the first third is slow, but by about it, I, I went back and measured it. About a third of the way in, this thing kicks in a couple of afterburners, and it doesn't let go. Thanks. We love yeah. hearing that. Holy balls. I mean, Rogue Asset is, pro- I think it, i got to be careful not to say it's my favorite of your series, because you got four of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like telling, yeah, it's like today, and you know who your favorite kid that I am? Right, exactly. Yeah. 
Well, the one that bought you the shirt, I'm sure, of course. <laughs> we are going to talk about Rogue Asset, of course, but I, I want to get caught up. We know there's uh, no less than four series going at a time. Let's rattle them off for those who are joining us for the first time. We got the Tier 1 series, Sons of Valor series, mm -hmm. Shepherd series, and the Presidential Agent series, which is the Web Griffin. And, you know, I know there's plenty of bone frog uh, uh, wine tasting that you guys probably have to attend to. <laughs> You've got the constant toying with the new Sons of Valor cocktail. <laughs> um, oh, and raising kids. But, I mean, come on. What, what what have you guys been up to, like, with all those plates spinning, as I like to say, since last we spoke? Again, that was uh, early September. Yeah, well, doing all of that, right? Um, the, it's, a, it's a mixed blessing, and we feel so blessed that we have the opportunity to write all these series. But it, it definitely means, uh, you know... Your workday begins when the kids leave and it doesn't end until after they get home. Um, so we've been working on those. We do have a, another series we can talk about later, that a uh, new book that's gonna launch in 2023, uh, techno thriller that we're very excited about. Um, but mostly we've been working on the next tier one book, which is uh, brings Dempsey back. We've been getting, uh, it's bordering on hate mail now. So. <laughs> We, we just want to share with everybody, we prom we told you it's coming back. We promised it's coming back. So we're almost done writing book seven, which is going to be titled Dempsey, uh, which will be coming out about a year from now. Uh, and we're really excited to bring that to people. People have been very patient. I'm just joking about the hate mail, uh, but we have been getting mail. Look, Wednesday, I think as recently as two hours ago, I answered one. So uh, Dempsey is not going away. He's coming back with a, with a blaze of glory here. Uh, in about a year. And of course, Sons of Valor, book two is coming out in June. Very excited for that. Chunk and his boys are going to continue to up the pace with his hunt for those terrorists. And then, of course, you, we talked to you about Shepherds. This is a very rapid schedule for the Shepherds series. So book one came out in September. Mm -hmm. The paperback is coming out in February. We're very excited about that. So people that uh, have been waiting for the paper, um, it's available for pre-order. And then book two in that series Dark Angel, that's coming out in April. So lots going on, man. We got a lot of work to do. We don't have time to talk to you, Dave. In fact, now that I think about it, we right. got to get back to work. Yeah, we'll wrap this up. Guys, thanks so much for your time. <laughs> uh, hey, I do have a question. Last time we chatted, you, uh, you, you cover boys were on the cover of uh, the Big Thrill magazine. <laughs> A, how cool was that? B, what kind of heat, press, knowledge, uh, experience, attention have you gotten since that? That was really exciting. Um, we shot those co the cover picks uh, when we were visiting uh, Blackstone. So we were up in Oregon um, at the Blackstone Publishing Headquarters, and we took a bunch of pictures in different uh, locations. We had one in front of um, Josh Stanton's truck which we really wanted to use. It was awesome. They had this big black truck with the American flag behind it, but to fit it in, we had to be too small. And as you know, David, you know, if you're going to be on the cover, you, you got to be big. You got to see your face, right? Yeah. It's very important. So we had to pick one of the other, other shots, but, you know, I feel like um, that cover was maybe like a, um, a turning point almost for us. You know, it's, it was nice to be recognized and asked to be on the cover. They get a lot of they get a lot of attention in that magazine for, you know, those cover spots and stuff. So we just felt honored to be on there. And, um, and I think, you know, like you joke about it, but we really do have our foot on the afterburner all the time, because we know that these opportunities are something you have to jump on when they present themselves. That's why we don't say no. And we want to keep all the series going. That's a great point. And uh, you, you, you gotta be saying yes. I've always worked on the theory of, uh, you can, it's easier to turn a yes into a no than a no into a yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to acknowledge something about you guys and, and you, you're going to get a little self-conscious on me. So just bear with me. But one of the things I love about you guys is that you're so grounded in just humility and, and goodness. You're good guys. You're fighting the good fight. You, you treat people right. You were joking uh, about uh, hate mail, which I know you were joking about, Jeff. And uh, because so much goodness comes your way. And I think there's this paradigm, if you will, that says, you know, good things happen to good people. And if you put good out, good will return. So I just wanted to say, give you a little a golf clap because mm -hmm. you guys are really living the dream and I appreciate it. 
That's really kind of you to say, Dave. And that's definitely, you know, we're, we're family people, we're people of faith and um, you know, you just got to be yourself and you be a good person and things work out. you just don't compromise your integrity and have a moral compass and, and things tend to work out for you. So I appreciate you saying that. That's Absolutely. It, you know, and I, and it, it isn't lost on me and maybe, maybe I was asleep at the wheel, but, uh, has Andrews Wilson gear.com been around and I just am now seeing the size that it's taking. <laughs> Well, we rolled it out, let's see, last year, I guess, and um, have some great partners producing some, some cool swag for us. Um, we also get to feature, you know, some of our veteran entrepreneur brothers on there. So Bottle Breacher, there's an Anders and Wilson Bottle Breacher from Eli Crane's company. We've got the Anders and Wilson Combat Flag, which yeah. is kind of cool. It's made from uh, two uniforms. So my uniform and Jeff's uniform combined to make the Andrews and Wilson combat flag. That's a first. Uh, it's an army veteran who owns this business and, and proceeds go to stop soldier suicide. And then with our combat flag, our proceeds, our share of the proceeds go to seal legacy, which is a charity, you know, we support. And then of course uh, the bone frog coffee, the bone frog blend. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just a, a website really for our merch. It's, it's also a way for us to continue this idea that Hey, veteran businesses in different spaces. Hey, we're an ecosystem. We're a force multiplier. We can support each other. So we're so grateful that these other businesses have partnered with us. Yeah. And you bring up another good point. Someone said in a recent uh, uh, podcast episode, and I, I can't recall at this exact second who it was, but they were talking about how wonderful our community is and that they hadn't been in it that long, but they were surprised <clears throat> at the lack of constant competition because they came out of a dog eat dog world, much like I did with radio and TV. And, you know, they'll smile to your face, but they've got a knife in their hand behind your back. And, and in this community, which you guys are kind of testament to that, you know, it's such a great community and we're all supporting each other. So when I see this store, yeah, you're giving Jack Carr a run for his money, but, um, but boom, boom. The, the fact that you guys are constantly giving back further uh, accentuates uh, uh, exclamation point to what I just said about how you guys, you know, support each other. And I love that. Yeah, that's and it's a really good point you make. Not, you know, we support the veteran community. We work very hard to do that, as as Brian was saying. But the community of writers in the thriller community, you know, there's so many veterans there. But even beyond the veteran ties it is such a welcoming community of people, isn't it? You know, it, just to give a plug to international thriller writers and thriller fest every, every summer, you know, that's the thing that makes that work is the people and the people are the writers. You know, I remember going there as a debut author. I was nobody. I knew nobody. I knew nothing. And Lee Child is walking over and saying hi, and you're having a, you know, you're having a cocktail with John Land, and he's, how can I help you? It is such an organization of writers giving back to other writers and lifting each other up, and that is a reflection of the thriller writing community. I yeah. think, you know, I met Brian at in this community. Yeah. Um, we became co-authors together. Met my agent. We met Tom Colgan, who we write for now. It, like every connection that I have uh, in this community came at least 95% of it came out of international thriller writers. So if you're a writer out there and you're not attending thriller fest, whether it's virtual or live, you, you got to be part of this community because it really is writers helping each other hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. We're going to give some more love to those cats a little bit later in the show because they have been so instrumental in helping build so many careers. And uh, I, I'm excited. I'm hoping to speak with KJ about uh, bringing the thriller zone to the thriller fest. Oh, oh, that would be cool. That'd be great. Um, but <laughs> back to you guys. One one quick joke, and then we're going to jump into some serious stuff. I am looking back on this. Uh, by the way, the only double hyphenated website I've ever seen, andrews-wilson-gear.com. I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> never seen that. Uh, are there action figures? Readability. It's all about readability. Got it. Got it. Are yeah. you? Are there action figures coming soon? Oh, that is a great idea. There we go. This is the Brian and no, I'm just kidding. These are <laughs> <laughs> the guns on that guy. Yeah. And I don't that's mean that, the AK. That's how you knew it was Brian and not me, right? 
I see. I see what you're saying. Uh, no, no action figures, but there should be, shouldn't there? Now we're we just need a veteran to start that business. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Oh, new, and uh, new GI Joe. Yeah. And speaking of ideas, I got another one up my sleeve for you that I'm going to pull out in a couple of minutes. Now, Brian, last time we spoke, uh, you gave my listeners what I like to call, and I, I, I giggled at this this morning when I was watching it about five o'clock. You called, uh -huh. you, you gave them a classroom in a soundbite when you spoke about self-publishing. And I know you guys are big dogs now, but every you were talking about every hour, uh, every writer should take uh, a moment and try their hand at it because you learn so much about it. Um, and you learn a lot about the big five or four or three, whatever it is today. But would you still, uh, even just these few months later, still uh, encourage writers, especially those guys who were getting started, who a lot of my audience are, you know, to try that self-pub world? Yeah, I remember that conversation. I think the big takeaway from that discussion was that, you know, you have to approach writing as a business and understand that it's a business. And that even if you are picked up by a traditional publisher, you still have to treat your career or your book as a business. It can't just be, I wrote this thing, I'm handing it off to you. And now you're gonna do the rest and I just go back to writing my next book. We all love as authors to do nothing but sit and write our books, but that is not the world that we're in today. And that's not what any publishers expect from you. So I think, you know, if you're spinning your wheels and you, you, you haven't been able to be, uh, you know, represented, you haven't, you haven't been able to acquire representation with a literary agent, you haven't had a novel published, there is no harm in uh, entering that self-publishing space. So you can learn. I mean, there's no better way to learn than to try, right? So exactly. you get in there and you, you get to learn about, all right, how do I take this book to the next level? What goes on with cover art, how do I develop a log line? How do I develop my synopsis and my pitch and my copy? And how's this thing gonna be positioned in the market? You could even go through the whole exercise and not actually pull the trigger, you know, and not actually release it. But now you're, you've thought about all the types of questions that an acquisitions agent is going to be thinking of, that a, a literary agent is gonna be thinking of, which is how do I position this? How do I sell this? And now your book is in much better shape to go to market. Yeah, superb advice. And it's so funny. Um, I, I was thinking about uh, this this morning as well because our mutual friend Eric Bishop is on this month's uh, cover of uh, the Big Thrill, and he was talking about something similarly that you gentlemen covered in that last podcast. And that was, you know, I he says, I'm. Paraphrasing, hey, I thought I'd write this book and put it out there, and I'd kind of kick back and you know have a stogie and watch it all happen. And he goes, he's really had a great learning curve this past few months about how much hustle it takes, and and he's one who really knows how to do the hustle too. Yeah, that's right, and I think that um, you know Brian was talking about the independent publishing primarily, but he alluded a little bit to the fact that those of us that are primarily in the traditional space it isn't that much different anymore. Yeah. The, days, the days of you turn the manuscript in and you work on the other book and a team of elves <laughs> create the market for you, that's, that's over. It's, it's, you know, there is an expectation by all publishers, including the big five, that you're gonna partner with them for marketing and promotion, that you're gonna leverage your connections, you're gonna leverage your background and your skill set to help bring it into what is now a very crowded market. And part of that is, uh, a, a direct effect of self-publishing, right? So in the old days when it was just the big five, you were competing for, you know, a voice in a pretty small place. There was, you know, few dozen really big books that were coming out a year. Now you're talking about literally thousands of books flooding the market and social media channels being jammed with writers from the big five to the mid list, to the independent, to everybody you have to have a place at that table for the book to be successful. And the publisher just simply can't do that for you anymore. They need you to be very proactive. And so, you know, the idea that, uh, well, I'm going to do independent publishing uh, and do all that work versus, well, I'm going to do traditional so I don't have to do the work. That's naive. You're still going to be doing that work. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's different. It's the distributional labor is different for sure. 
But uh, if you're not invested in the business and marketing side of your career, it's going to be hard to be successful. I don't care who you're with. Yeah. Another tasty soundbite. <laughs> I'm pretty sure working four series at various stages of development, and we talked about this last time, there's always kind of like one in the air as one is landing, there's another one starting. And, and I can imagine that you got about as much as a duo could possibly want. But is there, I always wonder this, is there a secret dream, perhaps a, a fifth item that you'd like to add to the repertoire? And what I'm speaking about specifically in, uh, Jeffrey, you and I've kind of bounced this back and forth. Is there, a, you know, would you like to add a little directing, a little producing, maybe a little acting again in the repertoire? I don't know. I don't know about acting. I don't I may not have the energy for that anymore. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, so I, I'll tell you this, and I think I can, Brian and I speak about this all the time, so I think I can comfortably uh, say this without consulting him first, and, I, and I'll ask for his opinion and chime in. But we never really viewed ourselves as novelists as much as we did storytellers, you know, and Brian loves to tell the story uh, coming up of how he really started as a storyteller aboard the submarine, orally telling stories as, in the great tradition of storytellers, right, before he ever wrote a book. And so for us, it's always been about the story, as you alluded to, I, I do have a very small background in, in theater and acting and being involved with my daughter's television show. Um, I got to do a little screenwriting and we feel like right now in this, in this market, it is so diverse. If you are just writing books or just writing TV shows, you're either scenario, you're missing a huge market share because there is an entire generation of people that they just don't read books. Yeah. They read graphic novels or they watch TV shows or they're more into movies or video games. And so we would love to diversify our storytelling across multiple platforms, multiple channels, and we've been very blessed with the opportunity uh, to begin to explore that. As you know, we have a, we have a, a TV show in development around the Shepherd series. Uh, we also have a, another TV deal that we're working on right now that we're very excited about. Um, but I think the future for Andrews and Wilson and for probably most storytellers is to diversify, not just in genre, but also in platform. Uh, and that's something we're very interested in doing. So many good sound bites today, Daddy. Wow. Mm, I could do a teaching course on this. <laughs> and speaking of this, Jeffrey, you gave me the perfect tee up. So here's my idea. And, and you hear it here first. It, and, and it's probably already in your cachet already, especially now that I know that you got two TV deals going, though. How about this? And I say this because of a recent guest, which I'll share in just a second. How about a team focused faith-influenced, military-themed graphic novel series like a YA Tier 1. I'm listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that sounds awesome. Like, what a cool, right? I mean, it's you're, you're pulling in. That's the other diversification, right, is genre and, and market or audience. So it's not just platform, but genre. The cross-genre has been a buzzword now for what about eight years, 10 years, something like Ten that. Years, yeah. And we don't really use the term as much anymore because we don't have to, because it seems like everything is cross genre now. And you look at the shepherds where we're blending faith and, and action thriller. You look at, we have this techno thriller sandbox coming out in a year and a half that is, you know, technology, science and military action. Everybody is doing that. And not just us, but everybody is starting to blend these genres because that's the real world, right? The real world is cross genre. Our yeah. lives are cross genre. We have romance in our lives. We have action in our lives. Some of us who have been in those communities, we have technology, we have science, we have spirituality. The real human existence is cross genre. And it's so when you use that as a mechanism to grow your storytelling and blend things that are just part of the human experience, it gets rich, it gets character driven, and it gets very exciting. So I agree with you. That's, that's it. I like your idea. We should talk offline though, so we can get this uh, buttoned up before someone steals it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I won't even, uh, well, it was a recent uh, graphic novel uh, guest of mine, uh, Janusz Neumann, uh, former Soviet uh, spy turned 
graphic novel creator and he's it was a a brilliant podcast it was a great reaction and this morning about 5 30 as i'm just gathering my notes i'm like that's what's missing if they haven't already thought about it mm. so there we, we'll talk all right let's jump into rogue asset i mean come on hey by the way quick question can i just uh shiny object the short attention span theater right here um <laughs> This reminds me of this particular style, such a such a tight, beautiful cover. Reminds me of, I think Joseph Finder, maybe Harlan Coben did some cop, uh, covers like this and that split, shadowed, just, you don't even know what it is about it, but you're like, I just got to read that book. I love that. It's got that retro feel, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's just, it's so sexy. All right, let's talk about this, though, because this thing, like I said, presidential agent novel, I got into it. I'm like, okay, yeah, 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 okay, I'm digging it, I'm digging it. And about a third of the way in, it the afterburners kicked in, and, and you're literally like, what? What? No, 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 what, what? And you guys have really mastered something. I'm going to shut up here in a second and let you talk. You've mastered this thing. I love it. Getting us just to turn that page. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and then you're like, Nicely done. I'm shutting up now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I think with, uh, with this book, one thing to keep in mind is it's the eighth book in the series. And so one of the things that we struggled with and spent a lot of time talking with Tom Colgan and working with the state is, you know, how much backstory do we want to get into and how many of these other characters do we want to bring forward? And, you know, the Presidential Agent series, if you've looked at any of the previous books, very rich universe. Um, we get to know Charlie's entire extended family, all his friends, their families. I mean, it's a universe of two dozen characters. And especially for um, new readers who are picking up this book as the first book, to try to duplicate that and bring you tell all the readers everything that's happened in eight years to all these people it would have been you know you said it took a while with the first third of the book that was with us just focusing on charlie right right uh, imagine if we had to do that with with the two dozen characters so we sort of said you know i know we might disappoint some people they're going to want to know what happened to the Mary Band Outlaws and all of Charlie's family and stuff, but we really can't do that in this book. So we really said, we're gonna focus on Charlie. We're gonna bring him in, bring the presidential agent, series, uh, presidential agent program back and, um, and then tell a really fast paced, engaging action thriller. So that's what we tried to do. Yeah, and let me, let me just add this too. Uh, <clears throat> I have this uh, unique ability, I, I think maybe, is when I go to read a book, I, I approach it with uh, like no history, no backstory. I tr because I'm reading so many books in any given week, I try to just go, okay, blank slate, mm -hmm. starting fresh. So the point of that is I, I just, I, you gave me everything I needed about Charlie and I didn't need all the other stuff. And you, and you, you dabbled it in just enough that uh, it, it helped bring me up to speed as though I had never read about him. And it had been years since I had, so I was okay. But I, I get where you're going, and I like that. Um, I think there's this little uh, lesson I think my mom, who's passed, taught me, and it was something along the lines of, it's funny that I'm looking into the white light as I say that. Um, <laughs> she says, you don't have to tell everybody everything. Assume, let your reader discover it themselves, and I think you'll be surprised. And at the moment, I kind of kicked and screamed, but with time, I went, oh, she's so right. For sure, especially in our genre, right? Um, there's a certain element of pacing and action that are required to be in this space. And huge volumes of backstory or huge volumes of technical descriptions, huge volumes of geopolitics uh, that are described instead of inferred are absolute, speaking as a writer rather than a reader, absolute pace killers. It's just impossible to give you, the reader, the action and pace you want and all of that information that you want, you got to pick, like you can't have them both. And if you, if you don't find that balance where there's enough of it that it can be inferred to a, to a level that's satisfying, 
but not so much that it drags the pace and the action. If you can find that narrow, very narrow tightrope, then that's success, speaking to the writers out there. So that's what you need to look to do. Um, readers, I, I say it all the time. I know it's getting boring. Readers love to learn and hate to be taught. Hate it. They do not want you to teach them anything, but they love to walk away from a book having learned something new. Um, and so you have to resist the urge to tell them everything you know, or to have your character tell them everything that they know that needs to be uh, organic and it needs to be contextual. You know, would this guy really have this conversation describing every aspect of his life in that moment? If the answer is no, then, then don't do it. And the readers will figure it out. Yeah, that's so good. And, and to borrow the cliche, less is more, but it's, it's so true. Um, for my listening audience who isn't familiar with uh, inhabiting the mind and imagination of another writer, uh, can you guys tell us what it is like to write your, your, well, the question is how you write as someone else. You're not actually someone else, but you're, you're inhabiting that character and all that, that world while still retaining, you know, your expertise. What's that like? Are you speaking specifically to writing in a, in a legacy series like writing yes. Griffin? Yeah. Griffin, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, it's, it's daunting because when it's someone like Griffin or Ludlum or Clancy, right? Because these are, these are icons. It was, it was overwhelming. It, we, I, I've been saying for a while, there were two rapid emotions when we got invited to do this, this overwhelming sense of joy, accomplishment, et cetera, followed by, what have we done? And <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let Brian speak to, to how we, we dealt with that. But it, what you've hit on is a very, very real thing for anyone that's written a legacy series. Yeah, I think when we, like Jeff said, I love that. I love that dread versus eu euphoria dread. I think it was euphoria first, then dread, right? Is that what happened? Yeah, that's how yeah. it felt for me. I mean, for us, uh, we, we, when we got to that dread, <laughs> we said, to Tom, now we're flattered. I hope you know we can't write like Webb Griffin. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, let's have this conversation. You don't need to. Like, I don't expect you to. In fact, uh, my experience with estate writing has been that when the authors try to sort of ape the master, it fails miserably. He's like, so I, I, I'm passing the baton to you guys because I feel like you're the type of storytellers, and we're sort of back to that storyteller theme, you're the type of storytellers that could continue on this series. So just write the best Andrews and Wilson book that you can. And for us, that was like somebody taking a thousand pound weight off of our back. And I can't tell you, the book wrote very quickly after that when we weren't worried about looking over our shoulder the entire time we were writing it. Griffin's legacy and trying to do everything like him. So um, I would say that's good advice to any author at any stage of their career, which is you might have your favorites, you might have your idols, you might look up to Crichton or uh, Ludlum or Mark Greedy or Don Bentley, whoever it is that you look up to, that is wonderful. And figure out what it is that they do so well, whether it's, you know, suspense or action or like you were saying, saying David, maybe one thing we do well is the wanting you to turn the page to the next chapter. Yeah, identify those things, but then write your book. Right. Yeah, it, it reminds me of, uh, I think it was, yeah, last week we kicked off uh, January with Ace Atkins and he was talking about writing as uh, Robert B. Parker. And he, he, that, it's so funny because that that's a very specific example of, Robert uh, Parker had such a, such a specific style and, Ace does a great job of mimicking that while still retaining a little bit of that Ace. But when you read other Ace stuff, then you clearly see that Quinn Colson is, you know, is Ace. And with this, it was a simple, because I've read your other books and, you know, it's still, it's like, um, there's a certain fingerprint that follows it no matter what you do. And that's the good thing. That's what I do like. I don't, I don't get distracted by the fact that I'm, I'm reading a Griffin piece, but, oh, it's those cats, uh, Andrews Wilson. No, it's, it's the synergistic combination of that that makes it even more enjoyable. Yeah, and I think it's inevitable that the voice is different than a, than a tier one book, right? Or a, yes. or a Sons of Valor book. For sure it is because we're in this other universe created by 
by somebody else. But I think Brian makes the, the, is for the writers that listen to this. And I know there's a ton of them. Um, the, I don't want to reemphasize what Brian said, that idea that you must find your voice, that you, you have to learn from your heroes and your, and the masters in this genre, but take those lessons and put them in your, in your toolbox and then write as yourself. You know, if you're trying to write like Stephen King, you are setting yourself up for failure. No one can write like Stephen King except Stephen King. But your young re- writers need to also understand something else, which is no one can write like them either. Find that voice that makes you unique. Incorporate those lessons like Brian is talking about into you know how they do dialogue or how they do character development. Learn those lessons, but then put it all into your voice and find your unique voice. Nobody wants another Stephen King. We got one. He's phenomenal. And I read everything he writes, but I can't write Stephen King, but you know what? He can't write me either. So uh, I think that's a really important lesson that Brian shared. My editor is going to have such a tough time cutting this show because it's just chock full <laughs> of <laughs> good stuff. All right, guys, listen, I, I, I'm a couple of things in the new year. I'm, uh, I'm trimming the show up a little bit. I try to get in and get out because everybody's super busy. Uh, I do want to finish up and I don't know if we had done this last time. Rapid, rapid uh, fire questions. Had we done that? Because that's a new addition to the show. I don't know. We're always game for rapid fire. <laughs> Come on, baby. Uh, we're going to start right now. <laughs> Rapid fire questions for both of you. I'm going to do this separately. There's only three. You won't get hurt, I promise. Brian, if you were going to come up with a new flavor for a branded cocktail, what would it be? A new flavor. It would have to be maybe the combination of something with maple in it because I'm feeling that wintry maple sweet So we got to work maple into maple coffee. Maple coffee bourbon maple coffee bourbon that's what that's it right there maple, maple coffee bourbon. coffee bourbon don't say it fast three times i love it <laughs> is it a hot drink or a cold drink i have to know because i'm i'm intrigued i'm 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 thinking about getting some redneck riviera whiskey and blending it with some coffee and, and maple syrup right oh now. let's try it both ways we'll make a toddy and that'll be the hot version and then we'll do it on ice sometime with like a shot of espresso poured over ice maple syrup and, and then the 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 redneck riviera Okay. I have to, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey, if you were going to act, and we referenced this earlier, and you don't have time for it now because you're too busy otherwise, but you were going to play one of the characters in one of the mm. series. You can pick any one of them. Who would it be and why? You get to be the guy, the hero. Uh, in one of our series, you're saying? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I think I would, I'm, I'm not going to take the central guy. Um, I think I would want to play Dan Munn. And the reason is we share a little bit of background. You know what I mean? He's definitely not based on me by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a lot of things that I, that I love about Munn. I love about, uh, I, I love him because he's, he's an action character, but he's got this whole grounded thing. He's chill. He's laid back. He's got a little bit of a dark side because of all of his loss. And he was a surgeon for a time. So I would want to play Dan Munn, I think. And I was going to say, if I got to chime in on the question, I think you should play Dan Munn. <laughs> and I will tell you that I say that as an apology to Dan Munn, because actually, <laughs> there actually is a for real life Dan Munn. Uh, hopefully he's not going to start getting stalkers. Based on <laughs> Dan is a surgeon who worked with us in special warfare for a period of time. Uh, he was never a SEAL, but he's an amazing human being, was an amazing officer, and he gave us permission to use his name in the series. So I can't live up to you, Dan, not the real Dan, just the fictitious Dan. I could be the fictitious one. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Brian, what is one tool or gadget that you cannot live without? Oh, I think that's easy. It's my iPhone. Um, you know, I think our iPhones have sort of become part of our professional, you know, it used to be you carried around a briefcase, you know, now it's everything's on the iPhone. Um, so I, I almost think you could run a career just off of the iPhone now with uh, the obviously the email and the texting, but the, these new iPhones now, I mean, with these three cameras and stuff, you can film a video that's ridiculous quality. You can do the editing on the phone. Yeah. So you could run your whole social media, shoot promos, 
send emails. I mean, the only thing left is just to dictate a book on there, right? So yeah, iPhone. Jeff, I'm going to give you the same question. Uh, what tool is never far from your reach? Uh, I mean, I don't want to be redundant, but that's the only one that's never far from reach. That and a laptop, you know. I, yeah. I'm I, I'm getting older, so I have to I have to put these on when I use the phone. Uh -huh. so, I, so I do <laughs> I do prefer the laptop uh, for that for that reason. But um, yeah, from a technology standpoint, there's everything's there there is a setting on the phone jeff where you can make the font like 68 point you know really. <laughs> i know but let me just tell you i am not going to ask my 13 year old daughter to do another thing on my technology it's getting too embarrassing and she's and she's now uh, brian knows her very well she's now mocking me openly so i i'm just gonna have to suffer with whatever it is she yeah, changed, I, she changed jeff, no i enlarged the font on mine and my 13 year old daughter said Dad, what is wrong with your phone? I said, what? She's like, the font is giant. I can read it from across the room. I said, well, I can see my, I can read it myself this way without my reading glasses. And she shamed me into changing it back. So now I'm back. Well, I, I'm such a technological idiot that um, my daughter, as a joke, changed my Siri to an Irish woman. <laughs> And I don't know how to change it back. <laughs> and I refuse to ask her. And as a result, I find myself when I'm asking Siri to do something, I find myself inadvertently slipping into an Irish accent, which I had to use in another part of my life one time. And it's just getting really ridiculous. So if you're out there, you can get to us through andrews-wilson.com. Send me instructions for how to change my Siri back so that I don't have to ask my daughter. Brian, what is on your bedstand right now? Uh, something you're reading in your spare time that you wouldn't probably, you know, that you're not working on. Okay. Well, I, I will admit that I went through this cleaning phase. So there's actually nothing on my bedside table except for my iPhone and watch charger. But I am uh, going to do a plug for this book, uh, March at Midnight by Ray McPadden. Now, this is a nonfiction, but it's written uh, with sort of the oomph of a, I mean, it's, it's not some dry nonfiction. I mean, this is Ray's memoir of what it was like to be in combat, what it's like to be in Afghanistan. So if anybody out there really wants to know what it was like to serve multiple deployments in real life in Afghanistan, um, I highly recommend this book. It's a Blackstone title. He's a fantastic human being, and he's a really, really, really good writer. So this is a uh, if I had a book on my bedside table, that would be this. It happens to be sitting on my desk, which is why I could pick it up. Awesome. So, yeah. That's, that's a really great endorsement. And you got me with the plug or the enticement of if you would like to know what it's like for real that is not fictionalized. So I'm, I'm very likely to pick that book up. That, that would be fascinating. <clears throat> Last question, Jeff. If you could go back and do your life over, what would you do differently, probably career-wise? So uh, as, as people out there know, I've had a very eclectic and, div and diverse career in that I've been everything that a little boy wants to be when they grow up, uh, with almost no exceptions. And this sounds cliche, but there have been, I've had struggles in my life, there have been tragedies in my life, but there's not a single thing that I would change. Every experience that I've had, whether career personal successes and tragedies have created the person that I am now. And, and they've given me the ability to work with Brian and, and create these books, to create these characters. It's that rich, eclectic experience mm -hmm. that I think makes me who I am. So while there are some things that are difficult, painful memories for me, for sure, I still wouldn't change them. And I always, I, I always think about, don't you Jeff, like wonder, like if I did change something, what would I lose? Like, right. right. Like what would the repercussions that ripple through my life and all the wonderful good things that I have and things I'm proud of, what, what, what of those would disappear? You know, that sounds like a short story that could be a TV series. Yeah. Let's write it when we get off the, off this podcast. Yeah. 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 Man, this, this has just been some kind of incubation place. <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> You may not be able to broadcast this, but the three of us have so much IP we need to create. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it'll be like a Jack Carr book where there's the uh, 
Redacted. Redacted. You just have these black bars that go over our faces for periods of the podcast. Oh my gosh, this has been uh, way too much fun for a Tuesday. I got to tell you that. Um, <laughs> That's the name of your next podcast. Yeah. Way too much fun for a Tuesday. So, uh, <laughs> guys, I'm. Well, is it safe to assume? And we mentioned this earlier. I'm glad we're circling this back around. Is it safe to assume that you'll be at Thriller Fest number what is it 17 this year up in May in New York? It's our plan. That's the plan. You know, the world's crazy these last few years, so. Anything can anything can happen. Anything can change. But yes, we are planning on being there. We definitely will be appearing on a couple of panels if we're there, um, and we'll be at the cocktail receptions. I can guarantee you that. So if you if you haven't met us and you're at Thriller Fest and you don't come up and say hi, then shame on you. Yeah, yeah, you guys are so approachable. So a great big thanks to the the Big Thrill.org and to ITW Thriller Fest, which is ThrillerFest.com. But even a bigger one to andrews-wilson.com everybody <laughs> thanks man we appreciate yeah it. If, if you haven't already uh, listeners go please sign up for our newsletter we don't sell or exchange or trade your information we won't spam your inbox you'll just get updates um about our latest news and series and stuff and and you'll get it first too so that's kind of one of the benefits of signing up is you'll hear it first from the newsletter yeah if you want to know what this other tv show is mm-hmm you could find out. We'll send it out in the newsletter before we even tell David. <laughs> <laughs> David, you have to sign up for the newsletter. Okay. I Am I not signed up already? Uh, also, tw uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, of course, which will all be on the screen here. But guys, once again, thank you so much for uh, cramming so much good laughs and great information and, you know, and rogue asset into one podcast. David, we'll come on your show every day. This is this isn't work <laughs> at all. It's so much fun. Maybe in June we come back with uh, Don Bentley at the same time because his book launches on the same day. I would love to do that. Would you? You guys be up to that? Yeah. Oh yeah, Don's oh. a good friend. We've done we've done appearances with him before. The only guy I know who wears the exact same plaid shirt every time I see him. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to see if he's wearing it for that podcast. We can all laugh at him. There you go. He's a Pearl Snap guy. So I, I actually wore this shirt for him. <laughs> I got a plaid Pearl Snap shirt. I say we all do it. All four all right. of us do it. Yeah. I'll do it. I'm in. Guys, I'll, I got to let you go and I got to get going. But thank you so much. It's always Good. such a pleasure. Great to Absolutely. see you. Absolutely. Stay in touch. We'll see you in New York. Guys, you thank you so you. much. All right. All right brother. See you, see brother. You. See ya. Two of the nicest and most talented guys in the world, right? I always have so much fun hanging out with them. All right, time to let you know who is on next week's show. And actually, there are two. My first guest isn't a household name yet anyway, but trust me, Nick Kolakowski, who writes dark and twisted characters on the outer fringe, is a vibrantly talented writer who is a hoot and a half, and I think you're going to like getting inside his head. I think. The other gentleman is none other than the New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap. Now, John writes the Victoria Emerson thriller series, the Jonathan Grave series, and a wide variety of shorts. Listen in next week as John shares a prolific career that is still burning bright. So until next week, keep reading. And if you're a writer, keep writing. I'm David Temple, and I'll see you next time on The Thriller Zone.